Hi guys, my name is Rachel. I'm 26 years old and I've been trying to get pregnant for 12 months. This video is going to be me telling you all of my thoughts, things I wish I knew, my plan going forward, what is our diagnosis. I'm also gonna answer a lot of frequently asked questions and just kind of tell you what it's like behind the scenes trying to conceive and being in that very small percentage of people who takes longer than a year to get pregnant. Quick disclaimer, this is gonna be a PG-13 video, so if you have kiddos listening, do that at your own discretion. So about 84% of couples are going to conceive naturally within one year of trying with regular intercourse, which is every two to three days. So of course I thought that of course I would fall within that category. And I also thought that I would be the one who got pregnant on the first try, if not the second, if not the third. It was a big shocker to me that it's taking this long to conceive. That is so funny because I have my laptop here and I just got an email that my fertility bill is due. <laughs> so anyways, we love that. It's very possible to get pregnant naturally after one year Year, it's just that the chances are lower for whatever reason. So anyways, we started trying to conceive in April of 2022 on my 25th birthday. And the first couple of months were pretty devastating. I would say that the first one to three months were probably the hardest months out of this entire journey, which you would think that it would be the opposite. Month 12 for me, which was this past cycle, which is actually like today, I got my period today. Month 12 was also really tough for me, but surprisingly the first three Three months were the hardest because that's when my expectations were the highest. So if I could give one piece of advice, it would just be lower your expectations. Even if you think you're perfectly healthy and maybe you are, that doesn't mean that you will get pregnant the first couple of tries. So just don't freak out. I wish I would have known that it's completely normal and I just wish I wouldn't have freaked out. Fast forward a couple of months, months four through six were a little bit easier because I was like, okay, I'm not going to get pregnant in the first three months, but surely, surely Surely I'll get pregnant before six months because I'm me, I'm Rachel. I succeed in life, I achieve my goals, I, I'm a type A, I plan for things. Like, of course I will get pregnant. No. And then about month five or month six, my sister-in-law Chelsea conceived on her first month of trying, but also not trying. That was a big bundle of emotions. And one of the questions I got was how do you deal with people in your life conceiving before you? And it, you just, you're allowed to feel all of the emotions. And that's what I felt. I felt joy for her and my brother, but I also felt like this pit of what about me, you know, which is such a selfish and jealous thing to feel, but I felt it and I'm just going to be honest. That was challenging, but I feel like it made me a better person. It made me more mature. I don't know how to explain it, but I am grateful that I had to go through that experience. And funny thing, so right, finding out she was pregnant was a little bit challenging for me. And then I was like, surely, surely I'll get pregnant before her gender reveal didn't happen. And then I was like, surely, surely I'll get pregnant before her baby shower didn't happen. And now she's giving birth uh, next month. So I have one more cycle to potentially get pregnant before she gives birth. I say that because now that I'm in TTC and I have been for a year, everything is in my mind, will I be pregnant by then? So any type of event or vacation or literally anything that anybody says of a future thing, I all my first instinct is, will I be pregnant by then? That's just something interesting that I wanted to point out that everything is kind of measured in when will I be pregnant? And it's challenging to always be in that mentality. Okay, so months six through 10, 11 were pretty chill, I'm not gonna lie. I feel like you go through those stages of grief, right? And one of those stages is acceptance. I accepted like, hey, it's gonna take me between six and 12 months, but hey, that's normal. Because 84% of couples conceive within a year, no worries, I'm gonna conceive before a year, for sure. Surely, nope, I didn't. But I'm grateful that months six through 12 were chill. I was having fun, I was hanging out with people more, I was doing fun hobbies and a little bit of traveling. So I'm grateful that I didn't like stress out too much. But then month 12 rolled around and that was a tough one. I cried for the first time in many months. I did a lot of crying months 
one through three, I did a little bit of crying at six months, and then 12 months, I also did some crying. Another question is, what is our diagnosis or what is wrong with us? So around 10 months, I went to see Dr. Rosef. He's a fertility specialist here in South Florida at IVFMD, that's my clinic, and we did all of the testing. Luckily, AJ has amazing coverage through his job, and he has fertility coverage, which is like literally a godsend, which I'm like, God, why did you give us this insurance? Is it because we need to be doing IVF? Anyways, Vinny is going crazy. Hey, relax. Month 10, we go to get tested. I will link that video down below of explaining our results in detail, but I have the MTHFR mutation, which means my body cannot process folic acid as well as someone without the mutation. So I am now on a prescription called Metanex which is basically a high dose of folate. Everything else is good with me. My tubes are clear. Everything came back normal, so thank God for that. If you hear rustling, that's my cat playing with her toys. AJ came back basically normal. He has high concentration, high volume, high motility, high morphology. Everything was perfect, except he does have a larger than normal portion of his sperm that are fragmented DNA. So basically what that means is the DNA inside the sperm is not 100% healthy in a sample of the portion. So we asked the doctor on a scale of one to 10, how big are our issues? Like how much is this really preventing us from getting pregnant? And he said it was about a two out of 10. So yes, there are some improvements, but overall there really isn't a reason why we shouldn't be getting pregnant, which is good news and bad news at the same time. AJ is on a supplement. I will link it down below and put it right here, Male Coast Fertility, and this just improves overall sperm quality and DNA fragmentation. So we've been on the supplements since month 10, so about two months, give or take. And our plan going forward, which was also a big question, is to continue the supplements and the prescriptions, give it two to three more months, potentially four, and then we're gonna go back and potentially do some IUIs. So an IUI is an intrauterine insemination. It's basically the turkey baster method where they take AJ sperm and they shove it up inside me. They give me a drug that makes me ovulate correctly on time with a nice healthy egg and hopefully that will create life. So typically you do three rounds of that before you move on to IVF, which is in vitro fertilization, which is where they take a sperm and egg, they actually put them together in a Petri dish, they let it grow for six days and then they implant it inside my uterus. That is a very involved, intense thing. One of the questions that I got was the ethics of IVF as a Christian, which I am. So that's something we can explore at a later date. I feel like that could be a whole separate video. But for now, the plan is give it two, three more months on the supplements naturally, and then potentially do some IUIs this year at the, like towards the second half of this year. A question I got was, does sex feel like a chore? That is a great question. And at times, I'm just gonna be honest, it can feel like a chore if we let it. I feel like months one through, four, five, potentially even six, we were still kind of figuring out how are we going to have intercourse this frequently and this routinely at a certain time because we have to without making it feel like we're using each other or yeah, it, it's hard. It's really hard. And I feel like it takes so much effort from both parties to really initiate and make it feel fun and not like a chore. And that takes a lot of effort. I'm just going to be honest. Some other tips that I have are to make the bedroom a place that you can enjoy outside of intimacy. So having some warm light lamps or having some candles or investing in high quality sheets is something that I am such a proponent of. And I do have the privilege of working with Brooklyn and my favorite sheet brand company in today's video. They make the absolute best, softest sheets you will ever find and they get softer with every single wash. I feel so cozy in my Brooklyn and sheets and it just makes my bedroom a cozy, safe place to be. I'm in my guest room. I'm gonna show you the sheets in here, but I wanted to tell you that right now, Brooklyn is having their biggest sale of the year. Everything is 20% off from now until May 4th. They don't have sales often, so be sure to take advantage of this. These sheets are just so soft. I got the Lux Sateen Hardcore Bundle and it comes with basically four pillowcases, one fitted sheet, one regular sheet, and a duvet cover. The softness is unparalleled. This is what my guest room looks like now. I could not be happier with the final look. I think clean, crisp white linens are so my style and they totally elevate any single room and my guests are gonna be so happy
happy sleeping on these sheets. Brooklinen's mission is to provide high quality luxury sheets at a fraction of the cost and they do that by cutting out the middleman. They have over a hundred thousand five-star reviews and they are the most trusted online bedding company so you can rest assured that you'll be satisfied with your sheets. You can also mix and match and create your own design with over 20 colors and patterns. So the sateen sheets are more tightly woven and heavier in weight than the regular percal making it buttery soft and perfect for all year comfort. I swear you guys the first time I ever slept in Brooklinen sheets I was blown away because I've never felt anything as soft and we have it in our master bedroom and like I said it just makes the space feel cozy. I feel at home and I feel comfortable and I just never want to get out of bed in the morning. So don't forget to shop the biggest sale of the year. Every single thing is 20% off until May 4th. Click the link in my description to take advantage of this very rare and amazing sale. Okay, jumping into another question. Were my periods normal before I started TTC? Yes, they were completely normal. I get regular periods. Like I said before, nothing is technically wrong with me besides my mutation that I have, but that is solved with the prescription that I'm taking. So the answer is yes, my periods were completely normal. I actually have my thing here. So this is what we're using, Conceive Plus. This is a fertility lubricant. You don't wanna use like Astroglide or anything like that because the lube can actually kill off some sperm and of course we don't want that. So I've been using this and also Preseed is a great brand. Really any brand that can guarantee that it's not killing off sperm is a good brand to use. Another question is, do I wish I started trying to conceive sooner? This is a mixed question because obviously the answer is gonna be yes for someone who's been taking long to conceive, but that's tricky because 84% percent of couples will conceive within a year so my advice would not be to just get off the pill and start right now that's not necessarily good advice because most people conceive within a few months have you tried stork fertility tea products or any sort of product over the counter that promotes fertility so i got caught into the trap of taking a million bajillion zillion supplements around month four five six i started panicking a little bit and i was like okay let me do everything let me follow these tiktok doctors and anything I read online, I took it to heart. And I ha at one point I was taking like 20 pills a day. As soon as I went to my fertility doctor, he said, Rachel, you need to stop that. Stop taking everything and just take what I'm telling you, which was my prescription, which I needed, and a prenatal, which is Ritual, which he loves the brand Ritual because it's clean and he knows what, exactly what's in it. So on top of that, I've only added vitamin D because my vitamin D levels are pretty low. It's at 40 and we want it to be at 100. So those are the three things I'm taking and I'm so grateful that he like slapped me in the face metaphorically and said, hey, relax, stop taking all that, all that crap that actually doesn't do anything for you and listen to me, I'm the professional. And I was like, thank you so much because I was getting overwhelmed at everything I was reading online and you just don't know who to trust. So my advice to you would be to trust a fertility specialist. If you are at a year or so, more or less, I would recommend not going to a regular OBGYN because you're gonna waste your time. They're gonna do some basic testing, but if it still takes you a couple months, by month 14, let's say, and you go to a fertility doctor, they're gonna rerun the same tests. So just save your money, save your time, go straight to a specialist who you trust, look at Yelp reviews, make sure there's someone who's known and the clinic has decent reviews. Just don't waste your time. Go straight to the professional and don't trust everything you read online. A lot of questions on how did we know that we wanted to have a baby? And I think this is coming from a place where a lot of my, a lot of you guys are like me. You're in your 20s, maybe you're early 30s, and you're like, when is it a good time to have kids? Um, I don't think it'll ever be a good time. Even now, when I'm in the thick of it, I'm still, sometimes I'm like, dang, do I really want a baby right now? Like, that's a lot of work. But in my heart and in my soul, I know it's time because when I see babies and when I see children, my heart aches. I look at AJ and I'm like, oh, I want him to be a dad because I know he's gonna be such a good dad and I'm ready to start that phase of life. I've always wanted to be a young mom, but that's where my faith comes in. So a lot of questions on how I surrender this process to God. It's one of the hardest things I've ever been through in my entire life. And I'm grateful and scared and happy and sad at the same time. I'm grateful that God is trusting me with this experience because that means that he knows I can handle it because God doesn't give us things 
that we can't handle. I know that he will come through for me. I know that in my heart because he always has and he always will and he never fails. And I'm grateful that one day I'll be able to mentor young women and even talk to people like you and say, hey, I've been there. I've been through it. It's okay. Let's push through. Let's trust God. So I'm grateful for that. But at the same time, I'm nervous and I'm scared and I'm like, what if I will never have kids? What if I can only adopt? What if I can't afford adoption? What if adoption falls through? Like all of these different thoughts. It's a daily prayer every single day. It's a daily struggle, a daily walk with God. And I feel so close to him right now because I have to. I love that God loves us enough to allow us to go through these trials because they make us better. They sharpen our character and they bring us closer to him and to other people. And overall, I just know in my heart that he will come through for me in one way or another. And he knows what's best for my life. I never really pray the prayer of, Lord, please let it be this month, this month, God, please, this month. I pray, God, you know I want a baby. You know we want to be parents. You know that we want it soon. So if it is your will, let it be soon. I never really demand or say I want it right now because God knows best. He knows our children. He knows at what point they need to come into the world and he is the author of life. Life does not happen without his permission. Right now, I get to enjoy my nephew who's being born next month. If I was nine months pregnant or if I had my own baby by now, I wouldn't be able to help her or assist her or be there fully 100% mentally, emotionally. So everything happens for a reason and I'm confident that, that God knows best. Here's one thing I wish I would have done differently. I wish I would have gotten off the pill sooner. So I got off in February and I started trying to conceive in late March, early April. So two cycles. I wish I would have gotten off six months sooner and done other methods of prevention, maybe condoms, maybe whatever, to give my body more time to regulate after getting off of the pill. That's something I definitely would have done differently. Are you using any endocrine disrupting products that are disrupting fertility? So this would be something like scented candles, scented lotions, soaps, things like that. I have mixed opinions on this. I think that yes, in a perfect ideal world, we would never be exposed to plastic or lotion or any of these things. But realistically, I don't think that they make or break your fertility, especially if your hormone levels come back normal and you don't have any issues and your estrogen, your testosterone, your progesterone, if everything is normal, don't freak out if you accidentally use a scented lotion. That's my opinion on that. Um, but yes, of course, ideally we would remove these products from our life. I don't like candles. I do use scented shampoos. Maybe I'll investigate that, but overall I don't use too many of these products and I'm not extremely worried about it. Someone said, may the good Lord bless you with the fruits of your womb. Remember Rachel, Jacob's wife. So Rachel was married to Jacob in the Bible and she struggled with fertility. Coincidence? I don't know. Do you think stress plays a role. Yes and no. I've done a lot of research on this and the general consensus that I've come to, and I'm not a doctor, I'm not a professional, is that yes, stress plays a role on overall health. So it can increase your cholesterol. It can uh, prevent you from exercises, exercising because you're stressed. It can potentially affect your hormones. But based on the research I've done, it is not, again, is not going to make or break your fertility. So yes, reducing stress is great and it will um, improve your overall health, but it's not really beneficial in a way. Like, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to quit my job and become a monk? No, we have bills to pay. We have things to do. So yes, let me reduce my stress, but again, it's not going to make or break anything. Speaking of stress, I actually signed up for my first acupuncture appointment. My fertility doctor actually recommended it. So he is a Western medicine physician, right? He believes in medicine. Obviously he does IVF and things like that. And he said, Rachel, this is the one thing that I think can improve your chances. Even I was skeptical, he said, of Eastern medicine. But this is the one thing that studies have shown, and you guys can do your own research. Studies have shown that acupuncture has improved chances of success on trying naturally, IUI, IVF, all of these things. I don't know why, but it's something I'm willing to try. I did not think I would ever be an Eastern medicine girly, but this is something I'm willing to try. It is expensive, so I'll take you guys along that journey. Are dermatology procedures safe while trying to conceive? For example, fillers, Botox, things like that. 
If you're new here, I work for my mom. She's a dermatologist and she has her own practice where she does all of these cosmetics as well as medical dermatology. I actually just did my Morpheus a couple days ago, which is microneedling with radio frequency. My skin looks a little dry, that's why. So I have the luxury of asking my mom, who's a doctor, hey, can I do this, can I do that? What do you think about that impacting fertility? And she guides me. So she tells me, yeah, maybe don't do that, maybe don't do that, but this is okay. So for example, I will never do something in my loop phase, which is the phase after ovulation, which is the phase where I might be pregnant. I never do anything like that. Whenever I do a procedure, I usually do it on my period, which is for multiple reasons. One, because I just don't want to do it in my follicular or luteal phase. I just rather not. And second, it's like a reward. It's like, all right, you didn't get pregnant this month, but hey, at least you can touch up your lip filler, right? I stopped doing Botox for multiple reasons. I don't think I need it right now. And also it's just one less thing that could potentially whatever. Um, but I did do lip filler. I did just do a Morpheus. I, I really don't do too much. I do laser hair removal on my period. That's basically all I do. And I always just make sure that I'm not pregnant at the time. How has TTC affected you and AJ's relationship? It's made us excited for the future. It's made us want to be parents more. It's, we talk about it all the time. We talk about what we would do in this scenario and in that scenario and parenting. And I would say it's brought us closer together for sure. And I just know that when we do achieve a pregnancy, it's just going to be such an amazing, happy filled, joy filled moment. And I, I, it really hasn't affected us too much besides that. I feel like we got over that phase of it feeling like a chore and now we have like a good rhythm and a good routine. As far as frequency, it really doesn't matter too much as long as you're doing it every two days, every other day or so. So in my fertile window, we are doing it about every other day, sometimes every day, but most of the time every other day for a week, 10 days, just to be sure that we caught the window. So at the beginning, I was very, very anal about tracking my ovulation with strips and temperature, and that is all great. And I think it's good to learn about your body and get into that rhythm. But after a certain point, because my cycles are so regular, I know when I'm ovulating and I don't have to test every single day, three times a day. So right now I just listen to my body. I get more cervical fluid. I get more in the mood. I've been doing it for so long that I just know. So I don't test all the time. Okay, I also wanted to touch on which products I'm using. So for ovulation, I really like the Pregable over the Pregmate. That's just like a personal preference there. I feel like it tests better. And I also buy these little like cups from Amazon to obviously pee in and then you dip the stick in so that I don't have to use like a regular cup. As far as pregnancy tests, I really love the Easy at Home. Everybody raves about them and like they're more sensitive. So these are the products that I use for testing. I never buy the expensive ones. I've never gotten a positive pregnancy test. So I just don't feel the need to buy expensive pregnancy tests until I actually get a positive. This is an example of testing ovulation. This is actually from a whole year ago, my second cycle. Can you believe that? So basically with ovulation, you test almost every single day. And then when the line gets darker than the control line, that's your peak day. So the hearts indicate intercourse and then you put the time that you took the test. So this is a great way to learn how to test ovulation. And then once you get good at this, you really don't need this. I started out by testing every single day from day six past ovulation all the way to my period. And now I almost never test. I'll test once on day 10 after ovulation or day 11. And then I won't test after that because again, I've never gotten a positive. So it's more like dreadful than exciting for me to test. What is something you wish people wouldn't tell you or say to you? when you're trying to conceive. I love this because there's a few things. Okay, first of all, when I see a pregnant woman now and we've we've had enough small talk to the point where I feel like I can ask them a question, I always ask them, how long did it take you? Like, that's my first question because again, now my brain is always timeline, right? How long did it take this person? How long is it gonna take me? Am I gonna be pregnant by then? That's how it is. Most of the time, I would say 90% of the time that I've asked people, they literally say the first month or the first three months. And then they ask me how, oh, what are you? Like, what was your journey? And I tell them, oh, it's been 10 months, been a year, whatever. And they're like, oh my God, have you tried fertility tracking? And I'm like, oh my God, yes. <laughs> And I know they're coming from such a good place, but it's just like, it. it's like really, it's just funny. It's funny to me. I never take it personally. I never really get offended. It's just, 
If someone has been taking a little bit longer to conceive and you have not been through that personally yourself, maybe just refrain from giving advice and just say, oh my gosh, that must be so difficult for you. How are you doing? Just be like, how are you doing? Like, don't, don't say, oh my God, you have to try this prenatal. That's what got me pregnant. Oh my God, you have to track your ovulation with the strips. Did you try the, did you try the strips? Yes, girl, I tried the strips. Like, girl, of course I did. Anyways, <laughs> and then the uh, the next thing, this, this comes from all people, men, women, older women, whatever. Just relax, stop stressing, stop stressing. That makes me angry because number one, again, from my research, stress really doesn't have too much of an impact. And number two, don't tell me that. Just don't tell me that. That's like telling someone to calm down. Like, absolutely not. Do not tell me that. First of all, you probably have not been through infertility, so don't even, don't even pretend to tell me that. Sorry, got a little heated there. This also, I don't like when people say like, when people are so confident that it'll happen for me so soon that they like, they want me to keep a baby product or like, uh, I was at a baby shower or, or something like that and they were like, take this because you'll need it. Or like, it's like a binky or like something baby related. And I'm like, no, like, I'd rather not. Like, it's okay. Like, I'll, I'll get the binky when I need one. Like, I don't want to hold on to this object that you think I need because you think I'm going to get pregnant this month or whatever. So weird things like that where people just like overreach instead of just being sympathetic or empathetic and just saying, oh, how are you doing? Like, really, tell me, how are you? I would prefer that 100% of the time. But again, I know all this is coming from a place of love. It's just whatever. Did you tell family you were trying to conceive trying to conceive in the beginning? Was it hard with them asking each month? Yes, I was very open about the whole process on YouTube, with my family, with my friends, and I don't regret that at all. I think it was a great way to let people in on my life. It was a little weird at the beginning because everybody would ask me every single month, are you pregnant, are you pregnant, are you pregnant? And I would be like, no, like leave me alone, I'm not pregnant, I'm actually really sad about it. You can't blame them, right? They're just asking, they're, they want to be part of it. Now, nobody really knows where I am in my cycle, and I like it that way so that I don't have people asking me. But at the beginning, it was like for the first couple of months, they were tracking like, okay, it's been a month. Is she pregnant? Um, but now it's been so long that nobody really knows where I'm at. And I like that. My husband and I have been praying for grace to be more supportive of all of our friends who are getting pregnant and it's hard. Any helpful prayers that you've been praying? Similar to what I said before, but in my prayer journey now, I've implemented a time to pray for myself and a time to pray for others. And I think separating these two things is amazing because I can cry out and I can say, Lord, help me, heal me, help us have children. And then at a different part of my day, I can say, Lord, I pray for my sister-in-law. I pray for my coworker, my colleague who's pregnant. I pray that you would give them peace and health and prosperity. And you can have both emotions at the same time and that is okay. And I think separating them mentally is so beneficial for your own sanity, for your own mental health, because you don't have to link them. And I know that's hard, but once you practice separation, I think you'll do better. And also think about when you get pregnant, do you want other people to pray for you? Do you want other people to be happy for you? And the answer is probably yes. So if you avoid all of your pregnant friends and you shelter down and you're jealous and bitter and you don't talk to them and then you get pregnant, and you expect them to welcome you back with open arms, that's gonna be tough for everybody involved because you were immature. I know that's a little bit of tough love and I am still working on this as well, but having the maturity to be happy for someone else while you're still struggling, I think that is going to get you so far in life in other areas as well, because that's just emotional maturity is being able to support someone else while you're still struggling. What is something positive that has come out of your TTC journey? Definitely the miracle of life. Respecting the miracle of life and how so many million aspects need to come together perfectly for a life to happen. Someone's calling me, scam likely, no thank you. Trying to distract me from talking about the miracle of life. That's weird, right? That's very weird. Not today. I've always respected life, let me put it that way. But now I have a much higher appreciation, respect, awe for babies, for people. Like the fact that you were just a clump of cells that came together and everything had to work out perfectly for you to be alive, to be here right now. Like. 
that just blows my mind and I just have like a higher respect for people. I don't know if that makes sense. So that's been amazing and it's just made me more excited for the future. I have more time to strengthen my relationship with God and I have more time to be present in other people's life. I've really dove into friendships this past year and just like valuing people over productivity and I think that God really wanted me to do that this year or last year, whatever. So yeah, in summary, my mindset currently is pretty stable. I'm grateful that I'm not distraught or anything. I am a little bit more sad right now at 12 months, but overall I'm okay, I'm happy. I'm steady, I trust God, and I'm excited for the future. So once again, we're gonna do two or three, potentially four months of trying to conceive naturally with our supplements, letting them have enough time to take effect and giving it a couple of cycles when it's already in full effect because it takes two to three months for AJ's supplement to take full effect. And then from there, I wanna give it two or three months of trying when it's in full effect. So then uh, we're gonna do a consult to talk about IUI, potentially discuss IVF because the chances of IUIs working is only about 20% per cycle and you only really should do three because once you do more than three, your chances of it happening are very, very low. That's something that we will talk about and I'll take you through that journey later this year. But for now, for the next couple of months, early part of summer, it's just gonna be regular life. So that's basically all of my thoughts at the moment, unless I'm forgetting something. If you have any other questions, please leave them down below and I'll answer them in the comments. One thing I will say is if you're trying to get pregnant or you find yourself in those YouTube loopholes, don't click on that video that says how I got pregnant the first try, how I got pregnant the first three tries. Don't fall for it, you guys, because nothing that they are doing is really making a difference. There's no position, there's no supplement that they took the day before. Um, Mucinex is a myth, according to my fertility doctor. Don't fall into that trap of thinking that doing this, doing that, doing this, doing that is going to get you pregnant because most of the time that is fake news and just save yourself the stress. I've, I've been there, I've done it, it doesn't work. If you're gonna get pregnant, you're gonna get pregnant. If you're not, you're not. I hope you guys enjoyed. I'll see you in the next one. Make sure to subscribe. I'll link my fertility playlist down below where I did my procedures, my testing, and I walked you through everything. Um, my low carb journey, which my doctor recommended for fertility as well. All of that will be down there. And I love you guys so much. I hope somebody got something from this video. I will see you in the next one. Bye. Also, don't forget to shop Brooklinen's biggest sale of the year. Everything is 20% off. Click the link in my description. You guys won't regret it.